Привет. Um, I uh, welcome you to the last day of the Moscow conference. It's uh, enjoyable to be here and to deliver a lecture about um, to deliver a lecture about Postgres uh, SQL features. Uh, I'm not how many sure of you are aware of the details, uh, but Postgres offers a very powerful SQL language, and this presentation covers two of those very important aspects. I'm going to think I'm going to move over there because I think that microphone might be better. Hold on. Um, maybe this is a little better. Uh, I'll turn that off. Yeah. Um, so anyway, it's, uh, it's certainly very nice to be here. Um, I'm going to have to adjust myself, excuse me. That's a little better. Uh, this uh, tutorial is designed for application developers, people who need to use the full uh, capability of the SQL language. The two areas we'll be talking about today are uh, common table expressions, which are very powerful, and window functions, which are very important when doing uh, analytics in SQL. Now, there was a small um, uh, change in the schedule. Uh, you might notice that in the printed schedule, uh, this session is listed for one hour and 30 minutes. Um, technically, uh, this session will could go as long as three hours. Uh, and I actually would need to ask uh, a question to determine how long um, we should uh, spend here today. Uh, we can deliver, so as I said, this, this lecture is two parts. It's common table expressions and window functions. We will start with common table expressions, spend about an hour uh, or a little more going through that. And then window functions, which is a roughly an hour and 10 minutes or hour and 20 minutes. However, uh, because this is a tutorial, we have two options. We can either go through the material and the slides, ask questions and discuss different features about this uh, database and about these features, or we can take breaks during the session to allow you to actually try the things I'm showing you. So the first one is more of a lecture. Uh, with discussion. And the second one is more of a hands-on tutorial where you practice while we learn about these features. It would be very helpful for me to know how many people would like just the lecture and the discussion part and how many people want to make it longer and have some time to actually practice on your laptops doing the SQL. Uh, if I could have ask for a raise of hands, how many people want the lecture and the discussion without the hands-on practice on your laptop part, the first one? Okay? Okay? Okay. And how many people would like the longer version where we actually take breaks and we actually practice on our laptops? Okay. Uh, that was really close. So what we will do um, is we will do part of that. What we will do is based on the schedule, there is a 30 minute break between 1620 and 1650. Okay? So during that time, I will stay in the room and people can practice in the middle there. Okay? And then after the lecture, I will stay until 1700 and we can again practice and I'll walk around and help anyone who needs help. Is that a good option probably? 
because we're going to take a break anyway in the middle any it's on the schedule so those people who want to do the hands-on let's do that during the break which is half an hour and then let's do that at the end we'll have an extra half hour is that good okay great so um, again for those of you who don't know me my name is Bruce Momjin I'm here from the United States uh, I am one of the Postgres developers and have been with the project for 21 years um, I, um, I'm on a, a long trip uh, to three more Russian cities uh, and then uh, Praha uh, before I go home. So it's, uh, it's kind of a long, long trip for me, but uh, I enjoy it. I normally come to Russia several times a year. I didn't come at all last year, so embarrassing. Uh, now I'm coming, and uh, it looks like I'll be back in September. We have a conference coming in, I believe, St. Petersburg in September, and then a uh, high-load conference in Moscow, probably. Uh, in November, I will try and make both of those. So, um, with that amount of introduction, um, I'd like to get started. Uh, obviously, we have a, a, a good-sized group here, uh, but I encourage you to ask questions. If you just want to ask the question, raise your hand, whatever. At any time, I will take breaks to make sure that I have time to answer those questions. Um, I was a high school professor for five years, so I kind of am used to that uh, kind of environment. And uh, uh, this is one of the values of the tutorial that you get to ask questions and uh, we can explore uh, various complex things. So I'll take breaks as I go and ask if anyone has questions and, and uh, we'll, make it, we'll make it as interesting as possible. Okay. Um, Again, this is uh, really a, a lecture highlighted for application developers. I know many of you are using SQL in a rudimentary way, in a simple way, just using it to store data and, and retrieve it, just very simplistic. Uh, but what you're going to find today with the two topics that I'm talking about are some very sophisticated capabilities in SQL that allow you to do analytic uh, analysis of data in the database instead of doing the analysis on the client you can do the analysis uh, in SQL itself and also the ability to do very sophisticated uh, looping and uh, encapsulation of one query in another query and feeding the output of one query to another query um, which is what we call common table expressions as well as recursion uh, these are very very powerful capabilities that allow you to simplify your application and force the database to do all the hard work. And that's obviously a win. It makes you more effective. It makes your job simple. And um, it makes your uh, application more reliable because you're not having to deal with a lot of very complex logic. Uh, so we are going to start with common table expressions. The first thing I want to highlight, and I'm, I'm sorry, I have two um, slide things here, so I'm not sure which one to look at. Uh, I'll look at this one today at the moment. Um, but this uh, URL right here, I hope you can see it. Um, I'm actually, I have, to, I have to admit, I'm a little worried that the people in the back, <laughs> I don't know this, but I'm a little worried that the people in the back, I seem to be very back heavy here, um, oh, it's there, oh, well, oh, there. and there too, right? Good, all right, all right. I'm wondering why, how can they see from way back there? Okay, you're good, thank you, excellent, good. Okay, so um, this, this uh, URL right here is, um, is, is where you can download these presentations. So if you want to download them now, you want to add them on later, um, there are these two presentations on the website. There's probably 20 more there. And there's videos of me delivering those presentations. So if you want to watch a video of this or another presentation, uh, feel free to do that. Okay. Um, so that's good. You have you have stuff up there, and you can see it. Great. Uh, so to start with common table expressions, we're going to look at uh, a little of the philosophy behind common table expressions. This might be a little unusual. Um, but you need to understand when to use common table expressions and some of the philosophy behind it uh, is actually very useful. Uh, the next thing we'll talk about is the syntax, uh, the syntax for common table expressions. Um, 
And then we'll get a little more sophisticated. We'll start to talk about recursion. Uh, that is the ability to repeatedly loop over a query several times, to re-execute a query several times. Um, again, with no logic, no programming logic, merely just in SQL, you can actually create loops uh, in, in the SQL language. And the most important part, I think, is section four, where we actually go through some examples of common table expressions uh, and show you a whole bunch of, of cases where we're using them. And finally, uh, section five, we'll talk about writable common table expressions, which is like just a whole new way of doing things in SQL. So the goal of this talk is going to get you through common table expressions to a point where you are confident in using them and you see the value of these common table expressions and how they can make your job easier as an application programmer. Okay? Now, of course, this is only the first presentation. We have another presentation, which we're going to cover after this, which relates to window functions. And window functions, just this is a preview, uh, offer a more analytic capability to Postgres, and that's also a very interesting talk. Okay? Uh, but again, we will be taking a break about an hour, 20 minutes in. For half an hour, it is on the schedule. Um, and you'll have a chance to go get some coffee, tea, and, and relax a little bit. Then we'll come back at, at 16, at, I'm sorry, at, I'm giving the wrong time. Uh, we'll be back at 15.50 and then go till uh, uh, 1700, right. that's what it is, great, okay. So, um, first talking a little bit about the philosophy behind uh, common table expressions. Uh, and this might be a term that you're familiar with in Russian. I don't know if, if you're using, you probably do use these terms. Um, the definition, for example, of an imperative language is one that um, instructs the computer exactly what steps it needs to perform. So if you're writing, a, normally if you're writing a program like a JavaScript program with Java or C or Perl, um, these are imperative languages because you're, you're saying set this variable, start this loop, make this data assignment, call this function. These are imperative. You're instructing the computer what you want it to do. Okay. In contrast, a declarative language um, is one where you declare what you want as a result and the computer is responsible for giving, for figuring out how to give you that answer. All right? And as you may suspect, SQL is a declarative language. Because when you're writing SQL queries, you are not making data assignments, typically. You're not starting loops. You're not telling it to call, you know, you're not, you're not really, um, instructing the computer what to do, the more you're saying, give me this information and let the computer figure out how to give it to me. Okay. So here's an example of imperative languages. Again, uh, basic uh, C and Perl. Uh, these are what we call infinite loops. So they're very common. Uh, when I was younger, and maybe younger than you, uh, basic was a very popular language and everyone would write a program like this. I'm not sure if you still do, if that's a big thing. It just says hello down the screen, and you're like, oh, I'm done, look, it runs forever. Um, the same thing in C, the same thing in Perl. Uh, these are basically imperative. You're telling the computer just to keep looping, the computer has no idea what's going on. You're just saying no, okay? Um, the declarative language would be something like this, where you're saying hello, and then hello, and then hello, um, but you have no way of of telling the computer to loop continually because it's not an imperative language, it's a declarative language. So you can't trick the computer into going into a loop because there's no way to say, hey, I want a loop, or I want an infinite loop. There's just no command for that, so you can't do it. Okay? Um, typically, when you're writing an application, 
you're, you're typically writing in imperative language, whether it's Java or uh, JavaScript, or if you're doing it in C or Perl. Uh, these are all imperative languages, and you're familiar with imperative languages. You're also familiar maybe with server-side imperative languages like PLP, GSQL, PL Perl, and C. Okay? And from a philosophical perspective, what common table expressions do is to add an imperative ability to the declarative SQL language. I'll say it again. What common table expressions do is to give you an imperative capability in a declarative language, in this case, SQL. Okay? And there are a number of cases where the declarative nature of, of SQL is insufficient and you need to tell the computer what to do because I can't really describe it unless I let you give me the ability to uh, imperatively instruct the server. And that's kind of what you're doing with common table expressions. Uh, this is the syntax for common table expressions. Um, probably the first thing you're going to notice is that it starts with the word with. Any SQL command that starts with the word with indicates that you are going to be using a common table expression of some type. Okay? Uh, second aspect, and we'll talk about this in a couple minutes, is the, the keyword recursive. Um, the keyword recursive is an optional keyword which allows us to loop over our, um, our query. And then you have um, some other clauses, and I'll show you some examples, um, which allow you to basically create some selects or, or other commands. And then um, this was added, of course, in Postgres 8.4, which is a long time ago. Um, but it basically allows you to loop over that uh, data set. Uh, let me take a break and ask if anyone has any questions. Okay. okay. All right. We'll keep going. Okay. So here is our first common table expression. And one thing you should know about my uh, lecture notes is that if I put text in red, the red text indicates that you should be looking probably at the red text. Okay. So I'm trying to highlight the part of, the, of this query you should look at. This is a simple one, but as we get farther along, you'll see that they get much more complicated. Okay. So, uh, if we look at this very simple command, uh, we have the word with. The with word at the beginning indicates it is a common table expression, right? We learned that. Then um, I have to name the common table expression. In this case, I'm going to use the word source. Could have named anything. Then I have a keyword called as, and then I have a query inside of parentheses. Okay, so this is the standard structure you're going to see over and over again with common table expressions. The idea starts with the word with, has a name for the common table expression, then the word as, and then some query in parentheses. All right? Uh, so in this particular example, uh, the, sim the query that I'm putting in parentheses is literally select one. Very trivial, okay? But select one is our, is our query, okay? And um, once you close the parentheses, which is obviously over here, okay? Um, once you, actually I think I might be able to do this. Let's do this, this is better, isn't it? Because now you can see this, right? Okay, so we're going to use this. So, so here's, my, um, here's my open parenthesis right here, and here's my closed parenthesis right there. Okay, so there's open, close, and here's my query right here. And the other thing you might notice is once we close the parenthesis here, we have another select command. So every time you have a common table expression, there's going to be some parenthesis part, and then a part at the bottom. And the bottom is your main query. So every common table expression has one or more of these pieces at the top with the width. And then at the bottom, you have um, a select command. Okay? Um, and what you're going to notice here is that the name of the common table expression is actually referenced in the outer main query. Do you notice that? 
Okay, so I've called the, the query source up top, and you'll notice that the main query, the one that's outside at the end, is using the same name. Okay, and technically what is happening is the data is coming out of the common table expression, and then it's going, it's, we're calling it source, and now I have a query at the bottom, and my query at the bottom can actually now use source as a table. So I've effectively created a new table on the fly called source, and I can join to it, I can use it in my where clause, I can use it in order by, I can do whatever I want because from the perspective of that main query, source is actually a table in the database, even though it isn't. Think of it as a, te a, a very short-lived temporary table, if you wish, okay? Um, and of course, you see that the output of this is indeed one because that's the way it works, right? It, it, the one is in the comp table expression here, okay? The one gets assigned this name. I do a select star from there, and there's the one right there. Uh, another thing that might be interesting to you is that the um, SQL that I'm gonna be using in this presentation can be downloaded. So if you go to the URL you see here and you download that SQL, it is exactly what you're seeing on this screen. So you could actually run it and watch all the SQL fly by on your screen uh, if you wish. Or if you want to play with some of the queries you're seeing, downloading that SQL file would be very helpful because you can then you don't have to retype it. You just cut and paste the queries you want. Okay, I'm sorry. Here's, um, here's the next query, a little more, uh, a little more complicated. What we're doing now is we have added a clause to the select inside the common table expression, and we've given it a name, okay? If I look back over here, I'm sorry, notice that when I do this query, the, the title of that is some unknown question mark, right? Question mark column question. It doesn't, doesn't, the column, the output column doesn't have a name. However, if I give it a name inside the subquery, inside the common table expression query, you can see that it has properly labeled that, um, that column, okay? Here's another way of doing it. Instead of adding the clause, the as clause here, I have the option of naming the column inside the common table expression at the top. And as you can see, it actually is also naming the output column. Okay. Here's an even crazier example. Okay. I'm naming the column in the common table expression column one. At the top I'm naming it column two, but in the main query I'm naming it column three. Okay. And as you can see, column three wins. Uh, it's the last uh, name that's being involved here, and in fact, it's overrun. But my point is that you have three areas that you can name these things in, and again, it's up to you which one, uh, which one is most uh, useful. Okay. Here's another example. You might think, oh, I can only return one column, but that's actually false. Here I have a query that's returning two columns, right? Column one, column two, pretty easy. Um, as you go to learn in a minute, uh, common table expressions use the union clause quite a bit. I'm not sure how many of you are familiar with the union clause, but the union clause effectively allows you to take one query and paste another query on top of it and, and output both queries together. So it's kind of like a like glue, it kind of sticks them together, okay? Um, here's an example of a union query that will select a, a value and selects another value. In fact, because they're the same value and because union by default removes duplicates, uh, you will get one row out of that. However, if you use the union all clause, then you, uh, you actually get the duplicates. So just a reminder, if you're using union, um, if, you do, if you do not use the all clause, all of your duplicates will be automatically removed. And as you'll see in a minute, uh, we'll be using union all quite a bit, and that's why I wanted to highlight that. 
So um, here's another example. Again, we're just building up here, so you're familiar with uh, with this, you know, in pieces. Uh, so here I have uh, the same query at the top uh, with source, okay, uh, doing one and two. But then I have a second query, uh, a second common table expression called source two, and that one is selecting three and four, okay. And when I now go down to this query, I say select one and two, I do union all, I select three and four, and in fact the output is exactly what I expect. Okay, so I'm combining two common table expressions and the union all in the main query, one union all is doing source and one union all is doing source two. Right? Pretty, pretty simple. Um, let's do it a little more fancy. So I've given you some really simple examples. This one is actually querying the system tables. Uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a very s silly example, but uh, I wanted to show you how to do it. So we have our select with source as, and in red we do a query. And at the bottom, in the main query, we just select from the source, right? There's no reason to do this. It's not faster, it's slower probably. I'm just showing you a real query on a real table and then the main query is just querying from that main table. Okay. Um, any questions so far? Let me stop there. Any questions? Yes. Okay, great. So the question was, um, and I'm going to go backward until I get to the query. Is this the query you're asking about? Okay, so the question here is how does it know, because the two columns are just have no names at all, right? How does it know what names they are? Because I didn't give any names to them, right? And how do you, like, which one? And something I never thought of, but you're, you're right. If, if they're both called the same, how is, are they different columns or not, right? I think that's, I believe that's the question. So the way, um, the way, that, the way that this behaves in Postgres is that um, when you're running a query, it knows the first column but it doesn't really have to have a name. It's just known as the first column, okay? And the second column is known as the second column, okay? Um, even though they have to happen to have the same labels, the system internally knows I'm in the first column and I'm in the second column. You are absolutely right that in a normal environment, you would always want to name these. Because I can't even join to these columns. I can't. The only reason I'm able to do this is I did select star. Right? That's the only way I got away with this. Because I did select star, it just said give me the first column and give me the second column. And I don't know what the names are. Right? But there's no way I could join with these columns. There's no way I could do a where clause with these columns. It would be kind of, this is a very terrible example, um, but I just wanted to kind of show you what it would look like if you don't name them. Uh, does that answer your question? Yeah. Other questions? Yes. Right, so the source table in this example and the source two table in this example only exist in memory. So as soon as the query is over, you can't reference them at all. Okay, they're just, um, in fact, the, the problem is that if you do a really big common table expression, you could use a lot of memory carrying along these, uh, these queries basically. Um, 
So that's what I'm, I'm kind of thinking, yeah. Oh, so what would happen if we ran out of memory? So if we run out of memory, um, yeah, I do have this one here. Um, I have one actually right here. I got two microphones, so. I think the trick is getting them to, uh, getting them to you quick enough for you to answer the question. So we're going to try and see if I can hear it quick enough. So the question was, what happens if you run out of memory? Of course, if you run out of memory, <laughs> yeah, your, your session's going to cancel the query. Um, and it is possible to actually have that problem that you'd run out of memory. So uh, yeah, don't do that. Um, it, is, it is a sort of a, thank you. It is, it is definitely, definitely a problem. Other questions? Great. So thank you, Anastasia. It's great to have. Um, okay. Um, so here, here's a little bit of a different query. This is, I think, the first time we're actually doing something creative with common table expressions. Okay? So just kind of bear with me here. Um, we're using the same query that we used in the previous slide, right? Uh, very similar. And what we're doing is we're taking the inner query, we're calling it source, okay? And then we're doing a select star from the source, okay? Makes sense. Then we're doing a union all, and then for some odd reason, I can't tell you why, we want another row added to this output. Okay? We just want another row. And I'm going to figure out the other row. I want to know the minimum language name in my previous output. I don't know why you want to do this, but you can imagine some cases. So the interesting thing here is that I have one source, okay? And I have my select star. And then I reference the source twice. Right? So reference the source twice. And you can see I'm running a min. And in fact, I have here C, internal, PLPG, SQL, SQL. And then I have that. There's that extra row right there at the end. All right? That's kind of interesting. It's something different. Oh, it's going to get a lot more different in a minute. But this is our first real different query that we're actually making use of the common table expression in some useful way. All right? Um, another example, here's an example of a uh, common table expression called class, which is a query on PG class table. And what we're doing here in red, as you can see at the bottom, is we're actually joining the output of our common table expression to another table. Right? So with class and then bottom, we're actually joining it and we get, we get the output. Okay. So again, kind of interesting. This is our first join using the common table expression. Okay. Um, this is uh, sort of a reminder of another command that you might not be aware of in SQL. Again, we're going to have to, we're going to be using it in a minute. And that is the case command. The case command is an SQL standard command. Uh, it allows you to do conditional uh, comparisons. So, for example, here uh, at the bottom, I will make the column, the second, the first column is called col. The second column is either going to be the word positive, the word zero, or the word negative. Right? And uh, this is not common table expression. I'm just reminding you what the case command does because we're going to use it in a minute. And I just wanted to remind you the conditional capability of the case command. Okay. So um, here's our first recursive common table expression. As you may remember from your programming class, a common table, a recursive query is one that um, runs over and over again. Okay. Um, in fact, we're using the word recursive here, but nothing happens. It isn't recursive. We've said recursive, but it doesn't do anything. It doesn't, it doesn't repeatedly run. It actually just returns one row. So even though I've used the word recursive, I'm not getting recursion here because I'm saying 
the common table expression returns one row. I select from source one row. Very trivial. So this is not actually recursion, it just uses the keyword. Okay. This one, on the other hand, does. This query will never finish, except I have to put a statement timeout in there. All right. So why is this one recursive and why is that one not recursive? Well, as you may know, one of the aspects of recursion is that you call yourself. Right? Do you remember that from programming class, right? Function calls itself, it's recursion. This one, this query doesn't call itself, just select one. This one does call itself. Okay? Why does it call itself? That's because we've titled the common table expression source. And inside the common table expression, we've selected from our own common table expression. And that's exactly what's happening. It's select recursion source as select one union all select one from source. And what happens is you have one row, which is a one. It selects the one. Then it goes, then now there's a one in there. The one comes in here, it does it again. And it just keeps going over and over again. This is completely useless. You would never want to run a query like this. But again, this is an example of what happens when you do recursion. Okay. Here's a bigger, like, kind of layout of it, so you can walk through it. So I say select one, so I have one row, okay? Then I come down here, okay? So then it says, okay, then it says select one from source, that's one row, okay? Then it comes back here, okay, now I have one more row. Oh, let me, let me get that row. Oh, there's another one. Oh, oh okay, let's put that, oh, there's another one. And it just keeps going over and over again and it never finishes. Okay? Doesn't, doesn't, isn't helpful, but we're going to use this capability in, a set, in the next slide. Okay. Here's another example. Do you remember I talked earlier about like hello and it prints hello over and over again? Well, that is, this is the hello example in SQL. It's never going to finish, but it's going to have the word hello. Then it's going to say, oh, here's a hello, let me go to the hello, oh, here's another hello, oh, here's another hello, okay, and it's just keep, keep doing that. That's not very useful, but at least you get the idea. This is an unusual. Notice here, I, in the previous example, I used select union all. What if I just use union? What happens? Well, if I just use union, remember I talked to you earlier, union gets rid of duplicates. So it doesn't recurse. It's like, oh, it duplicates. It's, I throw it away. It's just not the it, I don't need it. I've already got one hello. I don't need two. And it doesn't loop. Okay, it prints hello once. This is where it gets interesting. Okay? As you can imagine, looping over and over the same row, the same value, never finishing, is useless. Okay? But this example actually allows us to run the recursion 10 times, right? Uh, why is that? Well, okay, so it starts with the one, and the one goes up here, and then the union all says, oh, I'm going to select from source again. So here's one. Oh, is one less than 10? Yes. Okay, let's return two. Okay, two. Two comes down here. Okay, it's two. Two is less than ten. Yeah, okay. Let's turn three. Three, three down here. Four, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. When nine comes down, it comes down. Okay, nine is less than ten. Okay, let's return ten. Ten goes up. Okay, there's ten, ten. Is ten less than ten? No. Okay, we're done. Okay, I, I stop. So in every case where you use recursion in SQL, you're going to have some recursive capability, but you're always, always going to have to have some exit where clause. Some qualification that prevents it from running over and over again and never finishing. All right? And I'm going to show you a whole bunch of examples of how to do this. Here is the output of this query. 1 to 10. Right? If you run that query, you'll get it 1 to 10. Now, of course, this is 
a trivial example, we do have a generate series command. It's an easier way to count from 1 to 10. But this is just illustrative. Any questions? Okay. So, um, another thing I'm going to show you is uh, Perl. Uh, I happen to know Perl. And I, sometimes I'm going to use an example in Perl to show you what an imperative language would look like before we do the, the, the SQL version. So here's an example of just 1 to 10 in Perl. Right? So that's a 1 to 10. It looks like you, show, you saw what 1 to 10 looks like in SQL. Um, here's an example of the here's an example of, of a Perl example using recur of, 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 of straight. Here is how you would do the same example in Perl using recursion. Surprisingly, it looks very similar to the SQL example, doesn't it? Right? We start with one. We, we define a function, common table expression, right? We start with one and we put one into the function. So one goes into the function, one gets assigned to R, I print one. If one is less than 10, I call the function again with two. Two, two, print two, two is less than 10, three, 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 print three, three is less than 10, all the way up to nine, 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 print nine, nine is less than 10, output 10, 10, print 10, is 10 less than 10? No, it stops, okay? So just as we would use recursion in Perl, we could, we're doing the same thing, basically, in SQL. Uh, here's another example. If I wanted to do it as an array uh, in Perl, for those of you who like Perl, I don't know, um, I could basically create an array. I can start with uh, 1, and I can add 1 to the array, and then add 2, then call 2. 2 will be added to the array. Again, the same thing. This is actually a little more accurate because the common table expression kind of accumulates the, the result in memory. Remember I told you about that? that? That when you're running a common table expression, it puts the result in memory. And what I'm doing in Perl here is I'm creating an array in memory and I'm adding it in the memory. Okay, I'm trying, this is a little more accurate of what that common table expression is doing. Okay, any questions? Because we're gonna, we're gonna start climbing the hill now. Okay? Good. We, got, we got the basic part down. Now it's time to kind of go into the clouds. All right? Um, here is an example that does a factorial using common table expressions. Um, I think Yvonne showed this, didn't he, when he gave his... He had, he had a little talk about common table expressions. I think it was yesterday. Um, and, and he actually did something very similar to this. So um, here is an example. I start with one through the factorial. I then um, have the same kind of where clause. So I'm computing the factorial of 10. Okay. So I start with one, and now I add one and one times um, one times the counter plus one. So the two columns in this common table expression are counter and proc. So counter product started out one both. Here I have counter two. Product is one times two. Okay. Uh, counter is less than ten. So now I have one times two here. Now, um, now I'm running again. Now I'm doing three. Three times three times two is six. Uh, still less than ten. Then it goes up back up. Then uh, four, four, and I guess it's what is that? Six times. 4 is 24, and it's still less than 10, and we go on and on. I know that might be hard to follow, but this is what it looks like. Yes? Okay. So the question is, why do we use union all here? Right. Great question. So the question is, why would you use union all if, you, if your rules are different, why do you really need it? And the fact is, you kind of don't. But the problem with union all is that it's always going to be looking for duplicates. And every time you go to add a row, it's going to check, do I have that row already? Okay? And with a common table expression, you don't really care about duplicates. You have enough problems to worry about. 
Okay? So for efficiency, you would probably always use a union all in a query, even if there are no duplicates. Because, and I think this is, I've heard criticism of the behavior. Normally in SQL, if you want something to be done, you, then you name it. So if you want recursion, you say recursive, right? But for union, I'm sorry. For union, if you want to avoid something, you have to use a word. Very odd. And I've heard criticism of that. I, I understand why it was done this way. It had to do with algebra and so forth, mathematical proofs and stuff. But, but this is a very odd case where the addition of a word reduces the work instead of adding work. And I, as an application developer, every time I used union, I had to think, do I want union all? Like, every time. Every time I write a union, I have to think, do I want union all here? And in almost every case, I do want union all. <laughs> um, we've had many cases where queries would run perfectly for years, and all of a sudden, somebody look at the report and say, this is wrong. And I'm like, why? Well, it's, it's, it's only got one of these. There's two of these, and there's only one showing up. They're like, ah, oh, OK. And you wonder how many other reports had a similar problem, right? So union all. Uh, yeah, just every time I have to use union, I'm always thinking union all almost. Um, good question. Other questions? Great, OK. So the reason I like this output, it actually shows me the progression of, the, of this query, right? So it's showing me this query, it's starting with 1, 1. The first column is going 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, which we saw, right, on the right-hand side. And the second part, the second column, is doing this product. So every time it's accumulating bigger and bigger and bigger, it's basically taking this number and multiplying by this number to get this number. This number times this number to get that number. This number times that number to get that number, right? right? So you can visually see it doing the factorial um, and, and kind of getting the result there at the end. All right? You can see it really, really easy to see accumulating. Now, now, in a lot of cases, you probably don't want to see all the numbers that you needed to get up to this number, okay? So what I'm doing here in red is I'm saying, you know, run the query, compute the factorial of 10, but in the outer query, just give me the last row, just give me the row that's 10. So I've basically taken this output, I say, just give me the red row, and it's just giving me the red row. It throws away the rest of them, which is fine, okay? You see how it's a little tricky. Inside, I have to compute all 10 rows. I can't throw them away while I'm computing them, but I can throw them away at the end. OK? This is how you would do it in Perl. Um, uh, basically, you would have a function f, and it would create a, a, a subroutine f, and you would basically, here is the recursion right here, okay? Um, here's the recursion right here at this line right here. And it basically is starting at 1, 1, and then it's computing the factorial over and over, and it's pushing it onto an array, and then at the bottom it just prints the array, or the last row of the array, okay? So, kind of interesting, but that's how you do it. Okay. Now, uh, up until this point, I've used mostly numbers, but I can also use strings. So here's an example. I'm um, outputting an A, and then I'm adding an A to the end of it. So I'm concatenating an A every time, and I'm doing it 10 times. So effectively, my output becomes this. A, 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 A. And every, every time I run through the cycle, I'm getting another A. Very good visually, I think. Okay. Um, I, can go, I can even do some other cool stuff. I can uh, actually increment the, 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 the letter. I'm sorry, it's not Cyrillic, but it's, it's Latin, right? Latin letters. Um, so I take an A and I concatenate the next letter, in this case B, okay? And I do it 10 times. So, hey, I get this A, A, B, A, B, C, A, B, C, D, and all the way out 
all the way until I get the J. Okay? Not useful, but you get the idea of how it works. And again, visually, it's easy to, to see. Okay. I can do other cool stuff. Um, here I am starting from minus 10 and going to 10. So uh, my initial value is 10, minus 10, okay? And I'm incrementing it and I'm going to 10. So I'm going to go from minus 10 to 10, and then I'm going to actually print a variable number of spaces. You can see where this is going. Uh, and then I'm going to print an X. And then I'm going to print another variable number of spaces, and I'm going to print another X, and when I'm done, I get woohoo, an X, right? Um, it's kind of an X and then a lot of spaces, then as it's increasing, it's kind of going in, and then it gets, this, this is the zero, okay? Remember, minus 10 to 10, it's a zero, and then I get, go back up to 10 again, it's makes an X, all right? I don't expect anyone to actually use this, but you get the idea of what you can do. Very declarative, I mean, very imperative language, right? Um, how is this done? Okay, so minus 10 to 10, we're, we're basically repeating the number of spaces, and we're getting, you know, we're getting that X to show up, okay? And, and this is a little clearer. You can actually see the numbers, the minus 10 to 10, and have a number that's, I think I did the absolute value of the number, so it's really 10 to zero, back to 10 again, roughly. Uh, but you can basically see when it's minus 10, it's then getting smaller and then getting bigger again. Uh, I can do circles. Um, this is a little different because um, uh, I've changed the way I'm computing the number of spaces here, okay? Uh, and I, well, it's not really a circle, it's kind of a diamond. Uh, it's oval diamond uh, kind of thing here, okay? Um, I can round it a little bit, use a little exponents, uh, a little power uh, work here. That's, uh, that's more like a football, uh, a little more, uh, a kufta maybe if you're, if you're uh, Armenian, but anyway, it's sort of a food uh, we could call hachapuri, okay? It's a hachapuri shaped uh, uh, oval, I guess. We had that last night, and it looked exactly that shape, so. Um, and it realized it isn't always that shape, but that's the shape. And then with an egg in the middle, we could add a little flavor in there. Um, this is a little better. Again, I'm trying to play with the math a little bit. That's kind of closer to a circle. Uh, still a little distorted, but uh, you get the idea. Okay. Any questions about my circles and Hachapuri and things? Yes? Okay, so let me, let me rephrase the question so I think I can understand it. So, you're basically saying that when you're in, and I'm going to have to back up to show you the answer. Uh, when you're inside the common table expression, you only see one row at a time. Okay? You're not seeing, so, I mean, if I go back, let's go back to here. Um, let me, let me see here. Let me go back to the simple, 1 to 10 example. This is the 1 to 10 example. Okay. So when I'm running through here, my common table expression this, inside this block right here, the seed value and the recursion part, um, it's only seeing one row at a time. It's only processing one row at a time. And then what I did here is, I, in this case, I selected all of the rows, so I saw all 10. But if I do something like this, where I add a where clause at the end, then I generate all 10 rows, but I only show the user the last row. This, this part in red here at the bottom, right here. So the trick is, sometimes when you're running a common table expression, you want the user to see all of the rows, right? So for example, if I do my, um, my, uh, my Hachapurti example, right? If I just show you the last row, it looks stupid, right? You gotta see the whole, the whole bread thing, right? Um, so in this case, I did select from source, I didn't use a where clause at all. Okay, I wanted to see the whole output. 
But in the case of the factorial, where was that? In the case of the factorial, I didn't want to see the earlier rows, I just wanted the last row. So that's the, I think that's the question you're asking. Sometimes you want to see all the rows the common table expression generated. Other times you just want to see the last one and you want to throw away the rest of them. So it's more specifically the question that uh, apparently the select something from source, which is the CTE name, has different semantics within the CTA definition, within the uh, uh, parenthesis, as compared to afterwards. So, 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 so this I found at first a little bit surprising. <laughs> that, no, that's, that's a great point. So what, what, what happens... And, and I can, I'm actually going to back up here um, yeah, to this example. So effectively, while you're in the common table expression, if you use the word recursive, then every time you mention the name of the common table expression, it will reload any new rows that come from that common table expression. And this is the recursive aspect of it. But if you mention the table name outside of the common table expression, the common table expression is finished at that point. Okay? And therefore it behaves just like a normal table. And I think that is the surprising part, is that when you, you mention source here, it's continually feeding new rows and potentially a select which returns a row ends up feeding a new row into its own select. When you mention the common table expression name outside, it's done. And that's the point you're trying to make. Thank you. Yes, sir. Yeah, yeah, that is a perfect point. What effectively this is doing is the select is inserting into the source variable name the source table name, and it's sort of collecting the, it's collecting the selects as an insert would be, and then it's feeding it back into any other reference to source. In fact, if you mention source twice, I don't know what it would happen, like would it, would, would it get it twice? I guess it would. So you, you, there's, it's just a really weird behavior that the SQL standard committee came up with, but you're absolutely right, the select is actually as an insert into that table name when the table is inside, mentioned inside the query, inside the common table expression block. Other questions? Okay, thank you, Anastasia. Great. Okay, so let me uh, hop forward here. Hachapuri, okay. Oh, there's my circle. Okay, so let's talk about another mathematical example. Um, this is a little more sophisticated, but uh, um, we'll, we'll see if you like it or not. Um, effectively, uh, you can do prime factorization with common table expressions. Now you might think, oh, really? Yeah, you can. Um, prime factorization is basically taking a number and returning its prime factors pretty easy to understand. So prime factors of 70, for example, are 2, 5, and 7. Prime factors of 100, 2, 2, and 5, 5. Prime factors of 66, 2, 3, and 11. Okay. Here is a common table expression that actually factors a number. Um, it uses the case statement, which we talked about before. Uh, what we're effectively doing here is we are factoring the number 56. So we're basically saying, okay, and we're starting with the number two, and we're saying, okay, if um, is two a factor of uh, is two a factor of the um, of the 56? Because factor is number counter is two, factor is 56, is factor is false. So we say, okay, is um, is two a factor of 56? Um, if so, then return the value. If not, return counter plus one. Okay, um, that's for the first column. This changes the first and second column. If it's a factor, then return the factor divided by the counter. If not, return the factor. And finally, is a factor. Um, it does a modulus and it says it's a factor returns true, returns false, and keep going until the factor is not equal to one. Okay, 
And believe it or not, um, that actually does factor 56 because if you take a look at the true, at the, at the trues, that's a two, there's another two, there's a two, and it looks like the seven uh, are also trues. And in fact, um, so if I, so that's actually, as it's working, you can see it going two, four, five, two, three. It keeps doing twos and then gets to a three and that's false. So then it goes to a four, that's false. And a five, six, seven, it gets to a seven, that's true. And it keeps going and it stops, okay? Um, that might be too much output for you. So if we say, just show me the factors, don't show me everything else, I actually get this. The prime factors of 56 are two, 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 and seven. Okay. Um, I can factor bigger numbers. 3,322,434. Don't ask me why I picked that number. I don't know. Um, and I can actually say, what are the prime factors? And there they are. Okay. Um, prime factors of 66, uh, pretty simple. Um, uh, you can see the, uh, see that there's kind of some, some duplication here, like the two and the three, but then this is pretty inefficient. See how many, like we're, we're, why are we doing four if we did two? Why are we doing six if we did two? Like why are we doing this? Uh, it seems a little inefficient. So we could actually make it more efficient. We could say, um, only do the odd numbers. So do two and all the odd numbers. That's probably the simplest solution. We have a little where clause to do that. Um, and now look how much more efficient the 66 is now, right? Notice the prime factors are going two, two, three, three, then it jumps to five, right? And then jump right, to, right out to 11. So uh, just very efficient way of kind of hopping through this, okay? Um, we're returning only prime factors. This is another example, kind of squeak it out a little bit. So this is, this is 2, 3, and 11 is my prime factor of 66. Okay. Uh, if I was doing this in Perl, this is how I would do it. Okay. Um, if I was to do this, um, this, is, this is another example here, uh, which I think you'll find quite interesting. Um, I'm basically setting up an example called the part table. So this is our first uh, example, our first like real world example. Uh, so we're going to pretend it's part of an airplane and we're going to load up the part table with a whole bunch of parts and some of the parts are made of other parts. So the engine might have a whole bunch of different part numbers inside the engine, right? Uh, the uh, cockpit is going to have all different part numbers inside there. Even, even something as simple as like the wheel. Uh, and, the, and the strut, the, the, the landing gear is going to all different parts. So we're basically going to number the parts and we're going to kind of create a tree which says, okay, here's a part, it's part of this other part and so forth. Okay. So one of the neat things about common table expressions is that you can actually walk through a hierarchical tree of parts. So you might say, well, how would you do that? Okay. So you could say, okay, I'm going to start with part number two, right? And I'm going to union all. And I'm saying for part number two, give me all the parts that are inside part number two. All right? And then for each part that's inside part number two, give me the parts that are inside that, those parts. And give me the parts that are inside those parts recursively until I don't have any more parts. And when you look at the output, it will say part two is made up of part 21, 22, and 23. And part 22 is made up of parts 20, 221 and 222. And part 23 is made up of part 231. All right? Now that might be kind of hard to see, so I can make it pretty. What I've actually done is to add a dash to indicate how far down the part is in the hierarchy. I did it with this red uh, X's and dashes here. Okay, so you can now see part two is made up of these three parts and these are the subparts of these parts. Okay. 
Uh, maybe I want the parts in ASCII order, because as you can notice, the problem with this one is part 231 is actually part of part 223, but it doesn't display that way. Remember I told you that they're going to get up into the clouds as we went? Well, it's the plane part, right? Okay. Um, what I've done here is I've added an order by, right, in red, and now I can clearly see part two is parts, parts, these three parts, 22 is made up of these two parts, part 23 is actually made up of that part, has that subpart inside of it. Okay. Really no good way of doing this without common table expressions. You'd have to do all of this in the application. The application would have to query for every subpart and every subpart, and you'd be issuing queries all the time. But by putting the imperative logic inside the database, you can ask the database to give you a set of parts whole that you can then operate on within your application. Any questions? No? Okay. Um, I can also ask for the parts in numeric order. Uh, this is a little more sophisticated, but again, it gives me um, effectively what these are, are arrays. And it tells me part 231 is inside part 23, which is inside part 2. All right. And here's what the full output looks like again with the graph, with the array. And what's interesting over here on the right, on the left, is actually the order of the part, the how far part, how far down the part is in the hierarchy is displayed in that left-hand column. Okay. Uh, another example of common table expressions would be a dependency graph. Postgres actually has a dependency table that I'm going to show you. Um, I create a temporary table here in red. And I can actually, I know this is a really big query, but what it does is to walk through the dependencies for this particular uh, table that I've just created. Okay? And if I actually look, I can see from the dependency graph that the PG, the depth, this table right here, okay, has two dependencies. It has a PG type and a PG type array dependency, okay? Um, if I uh, don't want to see the object itself, I just want to see the things it depends on, I can remove, uh, remove that from appearing uh, and effectively just get uh, the two dependencies. And if I create a primary key on the table, you can actually see with this query that I get two new dependencies. All right, so this is using Postgres an example of common table expression to show you the dependencies uh, through the graph. Okay. If I add a serial column to the table using the same query, I now have four new, four new dependencies. Okay. Again, same query, I'm just running through the dependency graph that's processed inside of Postgres. And this is, in fact, what it looks like here in red. It's showing you the dependency tree. So just like the parts tree, the dependency graph tree is also a multi-level hierarchy. Okay. Any questions? Okay. So um, what we're going to do is we're going to go through the last nine slides, which um, are related to write. Uh, writable common table expressions. These are very interesting. Okay, and then we'll take a break, half hour. Could I get some some tea? Uh, and I'm sure they have food down there. And uh, then when we come back, we'll be able to go to the window function talk. And I will be here for the half hour. So again, people want to practice. We'll be able to do that. Okay. So let's let's spend the next nine minutes going through these nine slides, and then we're going to take a break. Is that good for everybody? Okay, so up to this point, we have really only talked about common table expressions using selects, right? Everything pretty much was a select. 
you'd select from the common table expression, you'd have a where clause, you'd use union all, they were all selects. One of the unusual aspects of Postgres is the ability to use common table expressions on data modification queries. That is, the ability to use common table expressions with insert, update, and delete. Okay. Very, few data, data, hmm, sorry. Very few databases support uh, common table expressions with insert, update, and delete. So what I'm going to show you is probably not transferable to other database systems. Um, but starting in the Postgres 8 series and really finishing in Postgres um, 9.1, which obviously was many years ago, uh, what we've allowed, what we've basically added is the ability to do insert, update, delete with with clauses um, and the ability for with clauses to be fed into insert, update, delete. I know that's a weird um, combination of things, but I think once you see it, it will make it will make a lot of sense. So um, let's create a table called the uh, RET demo, and let's put some random numbers in. It. So what I did was I basically just inserted three random numbers into um, this table. And what I also did was I did a Postgres specific clause here called returning. I'm not sure how many of you have seen a returning clause with an insert, but what happens is that you will do the insert and you will also get to see what was inserted at the same time. So think of it as a combination of an insert and a select. Does that make sense? Normally when you insert a row, it just says done. It doesn't show you what's inserted, it just does it. By using the returning clause, we're now returning the, row, the inserts that we just did. And you can see now three random numbers uh, here that have been inserted, right, by our, by our insert, okay. Now here's an, here's an interesting example of a common table expression. Here I'm inserting, um, I'm using the same query that I used up here, okay, to do an insert, but I'm also using the returning clause and I'm using it inside of a common table expression. So the rows that I did the insert are now part of source, and now I'm asking for the average of the three rows that I just inserted, the three random numbers. This is very hard to do in one query without common table, it's impossible to do it without common table expressions and the returning clause, okay? But what you can see here is I've actually done the insert and at the same time I've computed an average of those rows as they went in. And this is a common thing you're going to see over and over again, the idea that common table expressions allow me to take a, a couple different queries and bunch them together into one query so that I don't have to do repeated queries to go through a parts hierarchy or repeated queries to, I'm not even sure how you would do this because it's a random number, so you'd have to select the random numbers, get them down, compute the average, and then reinsert them into the table, right? Here I'm doing the random number generation and the insert and the average all in the same transaction at the same time in the same query, okay? So here's an example of using an insert in a common table expression and then using the output of that insert to do some type of uh, display to the user, okay? Here's a different example which you may find really bizarre um, what we're doing is we're deleting all the rows from the table and we're telling it to give us, by the way, once you, if you deleted them, give me the max of the ones you deleted. Give me the maximum one that you deleted. Very hard to do without the transactions because, again, you're using a single snapshot. You, you, you know, it's very hard to delete the rows and then, like, retrieve them and know the exactly which rows you delete because it, it's just really hard. Somebody can go in there and change the rows while you're deleting them, right? You don't want that to happen. So by combining the delete with the common table expression, you're able to basically 
do the delete, and then compute something related to the rows you just deleted. Is that clear to everybody? Okay. Um, here's, here's a bigger one. Um, I'm going to create a new table, a table called uh, Rep Demo 2. I'm going to insert three random numbers in it. I'm going to go, but here I'm going to go opposite. Instead of doing the insert and the delete and computing something, I'm going to compute something and then I'm going to do something with what I computed. This is opposite, remember? Remember, before I did the insert, delete, and then I computed something. Now I'm going to, I'm going to compute something. I'm going to compute the average random number. Give me the average random number in the table. And then delete everything greater than the average. I'm sorry, everything less than the average. Really hard to do this in a client sending separate queries. You'd have to use read commit mode, repeatable read mode. And there's a whole bunch of reasons it'd be kind of hard to do. Okay? But, but this is a great example of taking a computation and using that computation now inside of a delete. Okay? And in fact, now I found out there's only one row left. <laughs> so because I deleted everything less than the average, I have one row left. Whatever. Okay. Um, you, can, you can do even more. So here, I'm taking part two. I'm back to my parts table. Taking part two, I'm saying give me all of the subparts of part two and then delete them. Right? Why not? Use recursion, walk the tree, find all the parts. And once you've done that, join to the source table and just delete each part that's part of part two. Okay? I mean, doing that in application is really ugly. This is just very, very clean. And you can see that it just takes you into a whole new ability for doing stuff in SQL. This one, I have to admit, is kind of like I'm like throwing everything at it I can. Um, I'm creating a, a random number table three. I'm inserting three random numbers, okay? I'm saying, <laughs> I'm saying compute the average, okay? Delete everything less than the average, and then show me what's left in the table. No, no, oh, sorry, no, 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 I, I, no, sorry, I, I can't even figure it out. Take the average up here, delete everything less than the average, and show me the ones you deleted. Show me what you just deleted, okay? Um, again, that's pretty interesting, because we're doing three comp, we're doing, we're doing a select, a delete with a returning, and then another select which shows me what I just deleted. Okay? That's pretty cool. Uh, we can even do more. Here, here I am deleting, I'm creating an orders table and an items table. I'm deleting uh, the order number. And then I am, then, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, take that back. I am inserting the order number. And then I am inserting the part for the, for the order number I just entered. So I'm, I'm, I'm inserting into the order table and the items table with one common table expression. Right? I insert the order number. I use default. So I don't, know, I don't know what my order number is because it's going to give me a sequence number. Right? But that's okay. I don't need to know my order number because I'm going to return my order number in my common table expression. And then I am going to insert using the order ID that I just returned to insert the pool the part for whatever order it happened with, number it happened to assign me. Okay? Similarly, if I want to delete an order, I can delete my order, and then I can delete all the parts that go with that order together. Okay? Um, I can even do more. I can delete the order row, and then I can delete I can delete the order row, I can delete the items, and then, hey, you know, 
I want to keep a record of all of the orders that I deleted. So let's just do another insert on that. Right? So it's a delete followed by another delete on a different table followed by an insert into an archive table. So to wrap it up, uh, why do you use CTs? You use CTs because they give you an imperative way of controlling a declarative language like SQL. Okay? Uh, you can merge multiple SQL queries together and simplify your application logic as you've seen in the examples just before. It improves performance because you don't have to issue query for every part and every subpart. You can do the query holistically with one SQL command. Okay? Um, you, uh, there's certain snapshot advantages to doing this so that the query sees a consistent snapshot. You don't have to use a big transaction block and add some very sophisticated transaction isolation level in there. Also, there is an optimization barrier here so that your common table expressions will always be executed before the query beneath it. Okay? So, um, that does conclude the common table expression part of the tutorial. Uh, we are going to take a break until 1550, according to the schedule. I will be here for the next 30 minutes to help anyone who wants to try some SQL queries. And if not, I will see you in a half hour to talk about window functions. Thank you. Does anyone have any questions before we go? Yes? So that's a, that's a great question. Um, there is another command in SQL called lateral. And the lateral command is similar to common table expressions because it allows you to run a query and then reference that query in another part of the same from clause. So I would say they're complementary. Um, there are some cases that only common table expressions can do. But you're correct that lateral is often a good solution if you need a simple kind of a case where you just want to do a small query and, and reference it without looping, without recursion, something simple. You can do that with lateral. So thank you. That's a good point. Other questions? Okay. Have a great break. Thanks.